TV. So my son Gabe texted me and he said, Dad, you already got 2,000 views on the video you made about Israel, about what's happening in Israel. And I couldn't believe it. And sure enough, uh, it really caught on. And I think I have a, a lot of new viewers. There was only one guy that, a person, I don't know if it was a guy, one person said I was a hater and I hated the nation Israel. The one thing, how can you hate a nation? How can you hate a tract of real estate with borders, either, nat either natural or or political you, you can't no what i hate is religious hypocrisy and i'm not fond of hypocrites but there are hypocrites of every stripe i think the probably the most offensive thing i said on that show was that uh god called israel a stubborn stiff-necked people that's not me that's god but he loves them it's just like stating a fact but it doesn't imply whatsoever hatred in fact god loves israel so much that he's going to save the entire nation and he's going to make israel great on the earth israel's going to be the head of all the nations on the earth thus fulfilling the abrahamic promises that god made to israel's forefather abraham that uh their seed his seed would shepherd all the nations of the ground is a beautiful thing God loves Israel. I love Israel. God has not given up on Israel. So don't believe any of the preterists who say that God's literal promises to Israel are being fulfilled metaphorically or, quote, spiritually, unquote, in another people's, namely the nations. No. No. How can you get more spiritual? This is, drives me crazy when I hear this spiritual Israel. No, I'll tell you what spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel is the actual nation coming into its own. God putting his law, writing his law on their hearts, actively doing it and bringing the people to Zion, making them great. Uh, that is as spiritual as you can get. So you don't need to spiritualize Israel. It's already spiritual as heck. Uh, but the shock is that he's going to take a people who look like they're down and out, who look like they haven't got a prayer. And that, to say that of anyone is not to hate them. The Israel, as a nation, has not accepted her Messiah or their Messiah. We don't accept our Messiah. What about the Messiah? But they will. But they will. The future is bright for Israel. But in the intermediary, it's going to take some judgments. But God judges those he loves. If there's any Hebrews out there testing, one, two, three, read the book of Hebrews. God disciplines those he loves chapter 12 so since i have a lot of new viewers it seems and it's focused on israel i'm going to do a couple shows on this nation and how god's going to bring her into her kingdom i also have some great shows play, planned for you on the second death i'm going to explain again what the second death is and of course there could be some intervening topics here i always listen to you so if anyone has any recommendations you know i do act as a dj here you know i will play your favorites whatever you want to hear i'm the human jukebox the world's most outspoken biblical jukebox you don't even have to put a quarter and just drop in a slug and i'll give you what you want if i think it'll be of interest to most people in a nutshell paul in romans chapter 11 the first thing i'm going to do is go to scripture and the big question in Paul's day was, did God thrust away his people? Because Israel rejected her Messiah. And this is going to be a total cliff notes show. Israel rejected their Messiah. It's just a fact. Sorry, I didn't make it up, but it's true. And the question was, since God was now going to the nations, which was an incredible move of God. No one had ever foreseen that. That God would go to the nations without Israel mediation without the priesthood people that was a shocker so the saying was going around that well i guess god's done with his people and the see the preterists the people who say that yes god is done with his people or the replacement israel people the replacement theology is that god has replaced the literal people and the literal promises with another people who really aren't fulfilling the promises literally they're just kind of sort of being israelites and god is sort of kind of fulfilling the promises but not really i mean 
And to some people, if you even speak about a literal political kingdom in Israel that has the capital of Jerusalem and that Jesus Christ is going to come back, set his feet on the Mount of Olives, raise the 12 apostles, raise Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the rest, and to bring those people to Zion and actually use them to run a kingdom, they will laugh at you. How is that funny? It is not funny. It's the most fantastic thing. You want new covenant truth? I'm going to bring you new covenant truth like you've never heard. I am saying then, and Paul was an Israelite himself, so he's always concerned about God's, you call them God's natural people. And I'm concerned too. If it concerns God, it concerns me. And so I hate to see Israel run down. I'm saying then, does not God thrust away his people? Paul answers his own question. May it not be coming to that. That's Paul's way of saying, hell no. That's the way they said hell no back then. May it not be coming to that. Very polite, very civil, but it was hell no. For I also am an Israelite out of Abraham's seed, Benjamin's tribe. Paul is not using himself as an example that God has not thrust away his people. He's just saying that I care deeply about this topic. God does not thrust away his people whom he foreknew. And then Paul goes into the famous example of Elijah, who could have sworn that God was done with Israel. Elijah said, look, uh, they've killed the prophets, they've murdered all those people who sent you. Was Elijah an Israel hater? Well, listen to him. Listen to him. Lord, your prophets, they kill. Uh, sounds like he's kind of uh, generalizing here. Who's they? Israel. Your altars, they dig down. Who's they? Israel. And I was left alone, and they're seeking my soul. But God told him, no, I have a thousand men, not including women and children, who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And then Paul makes this startling statement in verse 5, that thus in the current era also, and we're still in the current era, there has come to be a remnant according to the choice of grace. What is a remnant? It is a very small amount. It is a almost like a ragtag group, kind of like a motley crew. It's like there, there, there's a, just a small number of people who are true to the Abrahamic prop promises and who still have confidence in God that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. So apparently it's difficult to find these people. Apparently they're not readily accessible because even Elijah, when he's told that God has 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. He must have looked around and said, you're kidding me. Where are they? It's like, I'm a pretty astute guy. I don't see him anywhere. But it's a, there is a remnant in the current era. That tells me, since we're still in the current era, I have many proofs of why this is still the current era Paul is referring to. Even today, there is a remnant of faithful Israelites who are true to their calling. They don't want Paul, as I've said to you many times, but... Please bear with me as I explain this to new viewers. I and many others have embraced a different gospel. It's a gospel of the grace of God. It has nothing to do with baptism, nothing to do with circumcision, nothing to do with law. It's complete and total grace, and it comes to unworthy people. I wrote a book about it called The First Idiot in Heaven. Yeah, if you've ever been depressed reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and wondering, jeez, I have to give away everything I own to the poor in order to follow Christ. I have to give away my shirt if somebody asks me for it. If somebody wants me to go a mile, i got to go an extra mile. Ah, this is tough. I have to be worthy to enter into the kingdom. I have to be true. Oh, my God, I don't think I can make it. For those of you who have read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and have become totally depressed, I have great news for you. There is a gospel for complete idiots. There is another gospel in the New Testament the so-called New Testament. There is another gospel for losers, for unworthy people who can't do anything right, who screw up everything, who have no confidence in themselves. And it is called the gospel of the grace of God. For convenience sake, it's also called the gospel of the uncircumcision. It's for people who don't care whether the ends of their penises are cut off or not because God hasn't told them to do it. Did you know God only told one nation to do the Ten Commandments? 
So isn't it a shock? All these churches that have the Ten Commandments on the wall, it's like, are you doing the Ten Commandments? How many commandments have you screwed up today? Well, why are they even asking that question? The Ten Commandments only came to one nation. Never came to anybody else. The nations did not have the law. So there is a gospel. And the herald of this gospel is the Apostle Paul. And my book called The First Idiot in Heaven is about Paul. He's the first idiot. Why do I say heaven? Because God is so uh, creative and unique. Whereas, whereas uh, you have to be uh, humble to inherit the earth. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. That's it. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So, Mother Teresa and other people tried to be so meek. Why? Because they wanted to inherit the earth. But there's a gospel for people who are not meek. There's a gospel for people who are assholes. And it promises them something even greater than earth. And that is heaven. Faithful Israel, they're not going to heaven. No, they're going to run a kingdom on the earth that's going to last a thousand years. They're not interested in heaven. But there's a gospel for complete morons, for unworthy people who know that they can't do anything right. And they look to Jesus Christ as their complete and total Savior. The only way they have a chance but it's not about chance. That was a bad word. Let me retract that. Is it the only way they can ever be in God's good graces is if God just decides to do something so completely gracious that it's like world record grace, world record love, like loving the unlovable. But that's exactly what this gospel is that I'm telling you about. And I write about it in my book, The First Idiot in Heaven. It's the best book you'll ever read. Go to my website, martincenter.com. In fact, I'll make it convenient for you. I'll put a link underneath this video. Hit the Show More tab, and you will see a link to The First Idiot in Heaven. It will explain to you that there is a gospel for you, the loser, the guy who just never felt like he could do anything right, because God loves those kinds of people. God loves the poor, the truly meek, the truly humble who know who they are. It took thousands of years to have a word for these people because in the Bible, thousands of years, it was only Israel. God concentrated only on Israel. Israel became an example of what not to do. Sorry, I'm not a hater. Israel became an example of how to fail in the flesh, of how people who try really hard to please God end up failing him. But because God's good, he's still going to fulfill his promises to them. So don't believe these people who say God's not going to bring a literal kingdom to earth with Israel as the head. He most certainly is. But after their Messiah came, and after that nation killed their own Messiah, sorry, don't shoot the messenger. This was the perfect time for God to temporarily take, take, take this nation and temporarily set it aside. And now something that had never happened before in the history of the human race. God was going to bring a gospel of good news of Aeonian life to non-Israelite people. Finally, a gospel for the rest of us. Why did it take so long? Listen, you are born in a fantastic era. Because if you could have been born in all these other eras, these times when there was only one nation in God's favor, and if you wanted blessed by God at all, you had to beg for scraps from the table of Israel. It, it, it was possible. It was possible. But you had to associate yourself with Israel. Israel had a monopoly on God. God freaking lived with them. He instructed them how to build a temple, and he lived with them. That's where God lived for a long time. I mean, there was a token of his presence in the temple. It was a token of his presence. God didn't literally live there. God doesn't live anywhere. God is everywhere. God can't be located with a GPS system of any kind. 
that's a pretty good calling card. It's like, what's so great about your nation? Uh, God lives with us. Hmm, yeah, I got to admit, that's pretty good. Yeah, we only have the Idiots Hall of Fame in our town. So, but you, God lives with you. Hmm, that's pretty good. But that ended when the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah, died on the cross. And that veil of the temple was ripped in two by God himself indicating that something new was going to happen. And Paul is explaining it here in Romans 11. What was the something new? So God was temporarily setting aside. The key is temporarily setting aside. And this is so wonderful. I love this to pieces. He's setting the stage. He's making everything look so hopeless. It's just like the middle part of a movie. There's always that one part of, of the movie where the characters that have been introduced in the first act they're trying to do something great. They have this goal, and then they're completely shot. They're done, and it looks like all hope is lost for your character, for your for the hero of the story. All is lost, and that's where we are right now with Israel. And people are walking out on Israel, and the preterists are saying, I don't know why they call them preterists. I don't know. I call them morons. I call them unbelievers because they don't think God is going to do what he promised to do. They've all walked out of the, out of the theater. Why? God's done with Israel. You walk out of the movie in the middle of the movie. What's the matter with you? Have you ever done that in a movie, an actual movie in the movie theaters? You get pissed in the middle and say, ah, screw this. Don't you know that at the end of the movie, things are going to work out for your guy or your girl? And every good movie... There's a satisfying ending. Things work out for your guy and your girl, but they have to go through this shit first, and it has to look hopeless. That's where we are right now with Israel, and it's been that way for 2,000 years. But, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to end, and there's going to be an amazing move of the Spirit of God and the people that have looked hopelessly out of it, down and out, not even accepting of their Messiah. God is going to work a miracle with them, and it's called the New Covenant it's not like the old covenant where God said, you do your part, I'll do my part. If you do good, I'll bless you. If you suck, I'll suck to you in return. I'm paraphrasing there. It's not literally what it says. but And then even people among us, like Alan Hess, angry Alan Hess, thinks that God is done with Israel. He says, oh, there's only one gospel now, and it's Paul's gospel, and there's no such thing anymore as Israel. Forget it. Peter's in the body of Christ. James is in the body of Christ. John is in the body of Christ. Oh, my God. There's a guy that's walked out of the movie and doesn't believe half of Scripture. It promises. I'm, I'm not going to get angry like angry Alan, but if you don't know Alan Hess, okay, well, he's a, he's a guy who believes in the salvation of all, believes in the sovereignty of God. That's great. It's good great teaches really well on that but when it comes to knowing what god is doing with israel and being able to look at the situation in the middle east today and understand why it's happening that paul explains to you why it's happening i'm going to get to that here before the show's over you'll see how can you be ignorant of that when god promises a new covenant how can you be ignorant of that now i know god promised a new covenant but it's, he, god's given up on it no paul is explaining the whole thing to you you might have an excuse for your ignorance if Romans chapter 11 had not been written. Paul says in verse 5, Thus then in the current era there has come to be a remnant according to the choice of grace. Verse 7, What Israel seeking for, this she did not encounter. Eh, that doesn't seem fair. Ah, but the chosen encountered it and the rest were calloused. So it's not me saying that the nation as a whole is calloused. It's Paul. The rest were calloused. Why are they calloused? A callous is like something you develop on your hand or on your foot. Uh, you work too hard, you're chopping wood, or you run too far in bad shoes, and you get this hardened skin. And after a while, it, it, it actually protects you, the callous, and you can't feel anything. If you have a callous, you can poke it with a needle and you can't feel anything. That's Israel. They're calloused. They are not responsive to the things of God. They're protected from the truth by, well, here's why. Verse 8, even as it is written, God gives them a spirit of stupor, 
eyes not to be observing, ears not to be hearing until this very day. And I say it's also until this very day. Darken be their eyes not to be observing. There you go, verse 10. But verse 11, I might have to end with this because look at my time. Verse 11, I am saying then, do they not trip that they should be falling? In other words, are they done? How anybody cannot see that God is going to finish his work with Israel after reading verse 11 of chapter 11 of Romans, I don't know. Do they not trip that they should be falling? Paul again says, hell no. Or Paul says, actually, may it not be coming to that. But in their offense is salvation to the nations. Because of their offense, God, well, God purposed that offense Somebody had to kill Christ. Might as well be the Jews. Had to be somebody. The Romans helped. Because of that offense, and because that temple veil was rent, and because Israel no longer owned the franchise on God, God sent out another message via the Apostle Paul to the nations. And Paul's explaining that here in the simplest terms. Their offense is the world's riches. In other words, because they offended God and God temporarily put them aside, the world is rich now because a new gospel has gone out for idiots, for losers, for people who don't want to go to church, don't want to be circumcised, don't want to be baptized, don't want to pay a tithe. You don't have to do any of that stuff. That's all for Israel. You don't have to obey the Ten Commandments. Not even one of them. You don't have to do it. Uh, don't worry. That doesn't mean you're going to be a rotten person. It's, they see, the Spirit of God will make its home in you, and the Spirit keeps you from murdering people. Yeah. It's amazing. I haven't murdered one person. And people might think, well, that's shocking because you don't go by the Ten Commandments. You say the Ten Commandments didn't come to you. No, it only came to Israel, one nation. How, how is it you don't murder people? Because the law says, you know, thou shalt not commit murder. I forget which commandment that is, but I don't know because it's not to me. But how can, how can you not murder anybody? Because the Spirit of God makes its home in me. And that Spirit has fruit. And the first fruit is love. Love, joy, peace, patience. If you love people, generally speaking, you will not murder them. I've not murdered one person. And it's not because I follow the law of Moses. Somebody might imply that, well, Martin hasn't murdered anybody. It must be because he's following the Ten Commandments. No, nothing to, do, nothing to do with it whatsoever. In fact, the law that said thou shalt not commit murder actually incites people to commit murder. Read Romans chapter 7. Paul says, I hadn't thought of coveting. I said, the law came and said thou shalt not covet. And the law... And my, my, my flesh getting an incentive through the precept of the law produced in me all manner of, of coveting. This is human nature. The more you're prohibited to do something, thou shalt not commit murder, the more you think, yeah, I think I'm going to go out and commit murder. That's exactly what Paul is saying, except instead of murder, he uses the example of coveting. All right, I'm going to finish up here. So, no. In their offense is salvation to the nations. There, he says it right there, to provoke them to jealousy. See, after the body of Christ is snatched away and after the glory is seen, the glory that God has brought to idiots, uh, Israel is going to be provoked to jealousy. Now, I'll end with this. I have to. Now, if their offense is the world's riches and their discomfiture, that is their discomfort, the nation's riches, how much rather that which fills them, that which fills them. Look at verse 15. For if they're casting away, not thrust away, casting away. They're just cast away like a fishing reel. You cast it, and you pull it back in. If they were thrust away, oh, God can't get them back. He thrust them away. No, he just cast them away. See, verse 1, does God thrust away his people? No, but he does cast them away. There's a difference between being thrust away and cast away. So they are castaways. If they're casting away as a conciliation of the world, what will the taking back be? The taking back. That's, that's in the near future, the taking back be. What will the taking back be? If not life from among the dead, God is an expert at raising the dead.